be turning in your Bibles to the book of John, the book of John chapter 13. In this passage, Jesus is celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples, his last night here on earth. And as the meal was ending, before the Lord Jesus took the cup after supper, which we know was the third cup of wine that they drank at the Passover meal. It's called the cup of redemption. And before the Lord Jesus took this cup, and when he did this and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, and the bread, he said, this is my body, he instituted what we celebrate today as communion. And in between the time that supper was ended and he took that third cup and he broke the bread, Jesus did something that to us seems unusual. John chapter 13 tells us that Jesus rose from supper, he laid aside his garments, he took a towel, he girded himself, and what did he do? He washed the disciples' feet. And we don't hear too much about foot washing today, but this is something that Jesus himself said that we should do. And years ago, churches had foot washings often. Do you remember some of you that, that are older? Yes, the most memorable foot washing service I was ever in. In our church, we was having communion and foot washing one night, and a lady went up to this old saint of God. She was one of those shouting Baptist ladies. And that was back in the days when churches were spiritual and ladies shouted and and the men would shout and this was a precious older lady that just shouted the praises of the lord and when this lady bent down and set that pan of water down in front of this dear old saint of god she picked her foot up and the moment her foot touched that water she let out this blood curling shout at the top of her lungs and she said Whoa! Wait, there's just something about the water. And I tell you, the Holy Spirit fell in that place. And every time that lady would pick her foot up and try to put it in the water, she would have another shout and feel. And I tell you, she splashed water all over the place. She wet that lady that was trying to wash her feet. And I don't think she ever got her feet washed because she was too busy shouting the praises of God. And I tell you, I have never been in a foot washing service like that one was that night. There was such an anointing of the presence of the Holy Spirit in that place as that precious saint of God just shouted the praises of God as we was having that foot washing. And I'll tell you, that service lasted for hours. And I don't know why churches today don't continue this principle, this practice of washing feet, when it's clearly presented to us in the Word of God. And in studying and researching about the subject of washing feet, I discovered that there is very little written about washing feet. And then I started thinking back over all of the years that I've been in church and heard hundreds and even thousands of sermons preached, I have never heard a sermon or a teaching on the subject of foot washing. Have you? Well, you're going to hear one tonight. The book of John, chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. The scripture says, Now before the feast, of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus knowing the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God. He riseth from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now, in Bible days, I learned studying and researching that the servants 
were the ones who normally washed a guest's feet. When people were traveling in Bible days, and when it came nighttime, whatever house they were close to, they would stop. And it wasn't like today. They were welcoming into that home. They were treated with respect. They were treated like royalty. The servants of that house ministered to that guest, waited on them, took care of them, provided for their needs. And in Bible days, I learned that there were different ranks of servants. And a servant of a higher rank would not perform the same duties as a servant of a lower rank would perform. And in a book called Manners and Customs of the Bible by Ralph Gower, G-O-W-E-R, he said something interesting. He said, slaves would remove the guest's sandals in preparation for washing his feet. Then a servant would wash the guest's feet and dry them with a towel. And then a servant would anoint the guest's head with oil. So as I studied that and, and began to understand this, I saw that it was just like a chain of command and like ranks in the military. And the slave was the lowest in rank and he would it was his responsibility and his job to bend down on the floor to unlatch the sandals, unlatch the latchets, and remove the guest sandals. That was his job. And then a servant, one who was higher in rank than that slave, would come, bring a basin and a towel, and the servant would wash the guest's feet. And then a servant would come and anoint the guest head with oil. And do you remember what John the Baptist said, speaking of Jesus? He said in Mark 1, 7, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. John was saying, I am not worthy. I'm not high enough in rank to even be the slave that bends down and loosens the latchet of my master's shoes. Everything in the scripture that Jesus did had both spiritual significance and it had significance to the Jewish people because they understood everything that he was doing. So Jesus in this passage was taking on the responsibility and the role of the servant. Now look at verse 4 again. Jesus laid aside his garments, he took a towel and girded himself. That is, he took off his outer cloak and his girdle that he was wearing. In Bible days, men wore dresses. I think they should still have to wear them today, don't you ladies? Amen. But in Bible days, men wore dresses. They were long robes, you could say. We call them dresses, but they were really long robes. And they had a girdle. And when they needed to move quickly or to run, they would tuck the skirts of their garment, of their robe, up underneath their girdle so they could run. And so Jesus took off his outer cloak, his outer garment, his outer robe. He took off his girdle, and then he wrapped a towel around himself. And what he looked like immediately to those disciples, they recognized immediately that he was taking on the role of a servant. Because the servant came out dressed in just the undergarment and girded with a towel. And just as the bread and the wine on the communion table is a picture of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that was broken and shed for us in his death, just as that is a picture, Jesus washing the disciples' feet is a picture also of his death and what his death provided for you and for me. The picture of Jesus laying aside his garment and then taking them up again is a picture and it presented a picture to the disciples even though they didn't recognize it at the time they did later. It was a picture of Jesus laying down his life and taking it up again because Jesus said 
I lay down my life that I may take it again in John 10, 17. Look at verse 5 now. In John 13, 5. After that, he poureth water into a basin. Now this is also, keep in mind, the duty of a servant. One who was of a lower rank. A household servant of the lowest rank would bring the basin and the water and the towel. And Jesus began to wash the disciples' feet. The Adam Clark commentary, which is one of my favorite commentaries on the Bible, he says that some Bible scholars believe that Jesus began with Judas and washed Judas' feet first. I believe so too. Jesus would have loved his enemy that much. We know that Jesus gave Judas the seat of honor because you remember, in Bible days they ate at a triclinium, which is a U-shaped table. They would put three tables together in the shape of the U. The seating arrangements were very important. You remember I taught you in Bible days. And the host would sit in the second seat. His most honored guest would sit to his left. Then the second guest of honor in highest rank or authority or position would sit to his right. And we know that it was John the Beloved who leaned upon the heart, or that leaned upon Jesus' breast at supper. And we know that Peter, sitting across, Peter was in the lowest position at the table, and Peter beckoned or motioned to Jesus. When Jesus said, one of you will betray me, Peter said, ask who it is. And John, laying upon the heart, the bosom of the Lord Jesus, said, Lord, who is it? And Jesus said, it's the one that dips with me in the ditch. And Jesus dipped into the ditch, and he fed the salt to Judas. And in order for him to be close enough, we know that Judas was seated in a place of honor. And Jesus fed the salt, which was the most delicate morsel. The best thing that was served on the table was reserved for the most honored guest. And the Lord Jesus chose his betrayer to be his most honored guest. And I believe too that Jesus washed his betrayer's feet first. I believe it with all my heart. Now look at verse 6. Here in John 13. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do, Thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Oh, Pete looked around and he said, Hey, there is no way, Jesus, that I am going to let you bow down and become low enough in rank to become a lowly insignificant servant and wash my feet. You are much too important for that, Jesus. Now get up from there. Don't you even think about doing that. Peter was all the time rebuking the Lord. You remember? All throughout the Word, he was always sticking his foot in his mouth. Always, always. So Peter was all mouth here at the table. And what did Jesus say to Peter? Jesus said, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. What does Jesus mean by this? It must have great significance because look at Peter's reaction in verse 9. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So what did Jesus mean? You will have no part with me. The New Living Translation of the Bible says it best. And I look this up in every Bible translation I have. And I have about 40-something different translations. And the New Living Bible translation says, Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you won't belong to me. Jesus was saying, this water represents me washing you, Peter, and cleansing you from your sins so that you can receive your part, which that word means your inheritance. Jesus was saying, Peter, I mean washing your feet. It represents me washing you and cleansing you from your sins so that you can receive salvation. Peter, 
If you won't let me wash your feet, you are refusing the cleansing of your sins. And you're refusing to receive the salvation that I'm getting ready to provide for you. I believe that washing feet is a picture of being cleansed from sin and having our sins washed away. Just like water baptism, we've learned in studying water baptism. It's a picture of being cleansed and having our sins washed away and our sins buried in those baptismal waters. And we are raised to newness of life when we come out of those baptismal waters. Well, I believe with all of my heart after studying and researching the principle of foot washing, I believe that it's the same picture. It's the picture that Jesus was conveying to his disciples of washing their sins and cleansing them. He would do it with his blood being shed at the cross, but he was giving them a picture of what was going to come. Look at verse 10. Jesus says to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, Ye are not all clean. I learned in studying that it was a requirement of the Jews to wash in a pool, not once, but to wash twice, before they could eat the Passover meal. And this is exactly what Jesus is celebrating with his disciples, is the Feast of Passover. So it was a requirement for any Jew that wanted to eat the Passover, they had to wash not once, but twice. So their body was clean, so it was only necessary to wash the dirt from their feet that had collected on their feet and their sandals from walking from the pool where they had washed into the house. So Jesus said, You have all washed, but one of you is not clean. One of you has not received cleansing from sin, which Jesus was giving them a picture of having their feet being washed, represented them being cleansed from their sins. And Jesus said, one of you hasn't been cleansed. And we know that he was speaking of Judas. Now look at verse 12. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Now look at verse 14. Jesus said, If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet. Think about it. Jesus, the Master of all, became the servant of all and he washed his disciples feet jesus was saying if i have taken on the role of a servant and have washed your feet then you should also take the role of a servant and wash one another's feet hallelujah jesus himself said that we should do this now i want us to look quickly at a beautiful story in the word of god of someone who washed the Lord Jesus' feet. We just saw Jesus washing his disciples' feet, but I want us to look in the book of Luke, chapter 7, at the story of someone who washed our Lord Jesus' feet. Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 through 38. Luke 7, beginning in verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed him with the ointment. Now you remember, they sat at a U-shaped table called a triennium. And when they ate in Bible days, the King James translates it, 
sat at meat. And it, this phrase means, or rather, reclined at table. And I've taught you time and again how that they lay down in Bible beds, on dinner beds, while they ate. And they would prop with one elbow, their left elbow, their right hand would be free to reach for the food and to bring the food to their mouth. And so that is how this woman could come up behind Jesus and wash his feet is because he was laying on a triclinium on one of these dinner beds. And as he lay there, this woman came up behind him. And she stood at his feet weeping. And she washed his feet, verse 38, with tears and wiped them with her hair. Now notice, look at verse 38. Look at it closely. Notice it does not say that she washed his feet with her tears. It says she came up weeping, but it says she washed his feet with tears. In the Greek Bible, it says she washed his feet with the tears. And I believe that this is referring to her bringing her tear bottle and washing the Lord's feet with her tear bottle. Now, let me explain for those of you who haven't heard about the tear bottle. In the book of Psalms, drop this scripture down, Psalms 56, verses 8 and 9, the psalmist David said, Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book when I cry unto thee? Then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. Psalmist David said, Put thou my tears into thy bottle when I cry. You see, it was an ancient custom in Bible days that during times of grief, when people were mourning and grieving, they would hold a tear bottle under their eyes and they would catch the tears. As the tears fell from their eyes, they would catch those tears in a bottle. And then these bottles would be sealed and put in a place in their house where they could be seen by anyone who walked in to their house. And at a person's death in Bible days, they would bury their tear bottle with them. And it was their most valuable possession. The most valuable thing that they owned in Bible days was their tear bottle. And I believe that this woman brought her tear bottle and she opened that tear bottle and she washed Jesus' feet with tears. The Greek says with the tears. So I believe that she brought her tear bottle, she poured out those tears upon the Lord Jesus' feet and she washed Jesus' feet. And I believe that those tears that she poured out of that bottle represented the tears that she had shed because of the remorse of her sins. Because, verse 37 says, that she was a sinner. And I believe that as she bathed and washed the feet of Jesus with her tears from her tear bottle, the tears of repentance, I believe that as she washed the Lord Jesus' feet with those tears, that she found forgiveness and peace and cleansing from her sin. And I learned in studying about the tear bottle that it was a disgrace for anyone to break their tear bottles or to empty them so that they would not have them intact at their burial. So it was it was just unthinkable for someone to open their tear bottle and pour the contents out of it. But you see, this woman, she didn't care about custom. She didn't care about any of that. She only wanted to receive cleansing and forgiveness and salvation from her Savior. She was bestowing her best and giving Him everything that was of value to her. Now look at verse 39. Verse 39. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw, he spake within himself, or he said to himself, he was thinking and he was saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, or Rabbi, Teacher, say on. And Jesus begins to speak in verse 41. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, 
Therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she had washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with all thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointments. Now you remember what we learned in the beginning. It was the lowest one of all in rank, which was the slave that would unlatch the sandals from the guest's feet and remove the sandals. And there was a servant, one a little higher in rank than the slave, that would bring the basin and the water and wash the guest's feet. And then a servant would come and anoint the guest's head with oil. Now verse 46, Jesus said, you didn't provide water for me to wash my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. But this woman took upon herself the role of a servant. And she served me by washing my feet. And what did this woman receive as her reward for ministering unto her Lord and for serving Jesus? Look at verse 47. Jesus is speaking and he says, Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins that are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. This woman received cleansing and forgiveness for her sins. And we also, just like this woman, are to take upon ourselves the role of a servant and minister unto Jesus and wash his feet. And you're thinking, well, how can I possibly wash Jesus' feet? Because he's seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40? What did Jesus say? Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So when we take upon ourselves the role of a servant, and when we wash our brothers and our sisters' feet, we are washing Jesus' feet. Because he said, in as much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. And Jesus said to his disciples, in John 13, 14 and 15, we read it. He said, If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. You know, the early church obeyed Jesus' example and they washed one another's feet regularly. You remember Paul in giving instruction to Timothy, Paul covered the requirements of a widow that was to be cared for by the church. Turn to the book of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Paul in his letter writing to his son Timothy and giving him instruction. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 9 and 10. Paul is giving instructions concerning the widows that qualified to be widows indeed, to be taken care of, cared for by the church. 1 Timothy 5, verses 9 and 10. Nine. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, under 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has what? Wash the saints' feet. If she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. Now notice, every good work. What was one of the good works that must be reported of 
by this widow. If she have washed the saints' feet. Washing the saints' feet is not a suggestion. It's a requirement in the scriptures. Jesus said, if I've washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Paul is instructing Timothy concerning the widows. One of the requirements for a widow that was to be cared for and taken into the church and her needs met by the church was that if she has washed the saints feet. And it's a requirement for us today. The Bible hasn't changed. It is still the same requirement for us. And remember as we do Jesus' words, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And so we're going to wash feet tonight. We are going to wash our brothers and our feet. And we're going to obey the scriptures. And it's going to be a blessed time. I've already prayed about this. I've already sought God about it. And I just know it's going to be a special time. And I'm going to pause the tape while we wash our brothers and sisters' feet. And then we'll come back and share about communion and partake of the Lord's table. We're going to do it just like Jesus did that night with his disciples. As he rose from supper, he girded himself with a towel and he washed his disciples' feet. So I'm going to pause the take. What a privilege it was. (laughs) Hallelujah. To fulfill righteousness by obeying the word and washing one another's feet. Thank you for giving me that privilege. Thank you for giving me that honor to wash your feet and to become the servant just as Jesus became that servant. The master of all became the servant of all as he washed his disciples' feet. Oh, there's just, there's just too much to cover, too much to tell when it comes to the table of our Lord. And always there's new people that have never heard the truth of the communion table. And so I want to tell it all, and there's no way. There's just not a good time. And I want us to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11. 1 Corinthians, chapter 11. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he is giving them instructions, and he's also admonishing them. And I've taught you before how that in the beginning of this passage in 1 Corinthians 11, he is speaking to them about the agape meal, the love feast, which preceded or went before them partaking of the Lord's table or communion. And you know how I've taught you that in Bible days, when it came to the agape meal, that they would set aside all of the seating arrangements, all that was the custom of health, they set each person at the table according to their rank, according to their position, according to their authority, according to their level of importance among the community. They would always seat those of highest rank, those of greatest authority, those most important at the head of the table, closest to the food. And then those of least importance would be seated at the lowest seats of the table down at the other end, furthest away from the food. But during the agape meal that the early church participated in, they were to set aside all distinctions of rank. The rich ate with the poor, and they were one. They didn't separate themselves. They didn't say, I'm better than you, so you have to take a lower seat. But what the church at Corinth had done was they had begun to revert back to their old practices of separating themselves and seating themselves in order by their rank and in order by their wealth. And the rich were eating most of the food. And they, some of them were even getting drunk. In verse 21, he is saying, In an eating, everyone take it before others his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. They were coming to church and assembling in the church service and the rich were eating all the food and the poor people and others were going hungry and some of them were even getting drunk in church. And Paul is saying, what? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not or those that are poor and didn't bring food? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Mm. Verse 23. For I have received of the Lord 
that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. And then he begins to give them instruction about whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup, the cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And it says, But let a man, verse 28, examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry or wait one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I say in order when I come. I shared with you before how that most preachers will beat the sheep over the head with this passage and say, don't take communion. If you have anything that you think would make you unworthy to take communion because you'll be eating and drinking damnation to yourself. What Paul is saying here is he's talking about the love feast. He's talking to the church at Corinth about partaking of the agape meal, the love feast, in an unworthy matter, which is being gluttonous, the rich eating all the food, and some of them getting drunk. Because he's still talking about this one subject down through this whole passage. Because, verse 34 says, if you hunger, let him eat at home. He is talking about the agape meal. He's not talking about partaking of the Lord's table, partaking of communion. You are worthy. If you have asked the Lord Jesus to become your Lord and Savior, if you have accepted Him, and if you have received the forgiveness and cleansing of your sins by His blood, you are worthy. Amen. And just as Amen. we have partaken of the wonderful privilege of washing our brothers and our sisters feet, which represented being cleansed, having our sins washed and cleansed away by the blood of the Lamb, just as Jesus said to His disciples, you are washed, you are clean, and just as that water washed your feet and cleansed your feet, the blood of the Lord Jesus has washed you and cleansed you from your sin, Amen. and you are worthy to come to the Lord table and to partake of his body and his blood. He has made you worthy. The Lamb of God has Amen. died. He has Amen. shed his blood. You are worthy. Amen. He has washed you. He has cleansed you just as that water washed and cleansed your feet. Jesus' blood washed and cleansed you from your sins Amen. and you are clean and Amen. you can approach this communion table this night and you can partake of the Lord's body and of his blood. Amen. 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 Thank you Jesus. You are worthy. You are worthy to come to this table. Now in the book of Luke. The book of Luke chapter 22. For those who have never heard the teaching on communion, I want to point this out to you. The book of Luke, chapter 22, beginning in verse 17. Luke, chapter 22, verse 17. And he took the cup, notice the cup, and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. 
Look at verse 20. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now look at verse 17. Jesus took the cup, and he gave thanks over that cup. Then in verse 20, likewise also the cup after supper. This points out two cups which they drank, and it was the cup after supper, verse 20. It was the third cup, the cup of redemption, that Jesus said is the cup of the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And do you remember that as Jesus poured that third cup, and as he said those words, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. The disciples immediately understood the significance of that cup because only the words were spoken concerning this cup at a marriage proposal. You remember I taught you before how in Bible days the Jewish custom was that the young people did not date. The parents arranged the marriage ceremony for their children. And the son and his father would go to the prospective bride's home. They would take a marriage contract. They would negotiate the bride price or the price that this young man would pay for this bride. And after all of the negotiations were complete, and after the agreement was made, the father of the groom would pour a cup of wine. He would hand that cup of wine to his son. His son would take the cup of wine and set it down at the table before the young woman. And this prospective groom would point to that cup and say, This cup is a covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And the young woman had a choice. She could pick that cup up and hand it back, which was her refusal of the marriage proposal, or she could pick that cup up and drink that cup. And without saying a word, if she drank that cup, she was saying yes to this boy's marriage proposal. She was saying, yes, I will be your bride. And as she drank that cup, the young man would jump up from the table and he would say, I go to prepare a place for you. And he would go back to his father's house and he would prepare a place for his bride. He would build a room onto his father's house. And from time to time, his father would come and inspect that room, that little mansion, to be sure that it was properly built to be sure that only the best materials that they could possibly afford was put into this room, this mansion for this bride. And the son in the Jewish household did not know when his own wedding day would be. Only the father knew the wedding day. And what did Jesus say? He said, no man knows the day nor the hour, but my father only. And when the father would inspect that room, that mansion, and when he would determine that it was ready, then he would say, son, go get your bride. And in the Jewish community, as the bridal procession would go forth, they would always send a herald. This herald would go before the bridegroom and his company. And they would ease through the streets, not making a sound, because the bride was taken by surprise. She didn't know when her bride and groom was coming for her. So she had to always be watching and be ready. And what did Jesus say? Watch, for you know not the hour when the Son of Man comes. And so the herald would go forth before the bridegroom and his company. And when they got close to the house, the herald would begin to sound and he would begin to shout, and he would begin to proclaim, Behold, the bridegroom cometh! Behold, the bridegroom cometh! Go ye out to meet him! And when that shout went forth, the bride jumped out of bed, 
Normally Jewish weddings are held at night. And she would jump out of bed. She would light that candle that she kept by her bed. She would get herself ready. Put the veil over her face. Her bridesmaids would get themselves ready and prepared. And they knew that the bridegroom would be there in just moments because the herald had sounded. And when Jesus will return for us, for his bride, Amen. an angel will be the herald. An angel will proclaim and he will sound and he will say, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And in the Jewish wedding, when the herald would sound and when the bridegroom and the whole bridal company would arrive at the house, the bride and her bridesmaids would go out into the street and they would all go down the street singing and rejoicing and everybody in the town and in the community would know that there is a wedding getting ready to take place back at the father's house and when they got back to the father's house they would have a party and that's what's going to happen when our bridegroom mother, when Jesus, our bridegroom, Amen. comes for us, his bride, he will come back right. and he will take us. He is now preparing a mansion for you and for me. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. Amen. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And where I am, there ye may be also. And when Jesus the very supper of the Lamb, when the Father turns to his Son and says, Son, the mansions are ready. Go get your bride. And the angels, the heralds, go forth, and when they sound and say, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And when Jesus splits the eastern sky, and when he goes for his bride, the church, he will take us back to the Father's house. We will have our mansion, our bridal chamber that he is preparing for us. And we will sit down at the table at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And what is our Lord and our Savior going to do at that marriage supper of the Lamb? Servants. The master of all will become the servant of all. And he will serve us and he will minister to us because we will become his bride. And when that marriage supper of the Lamb takes place, we will be married to the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, we will become Mrs. Jesus Christ. The happy bride and our bridegroom will serve us just as you and I, the body of Christ, have served one another this day. Not. Yes. What a significant the communion cup is. It's the Lord Jesus' marriage proposal to us. Because he presented that proposal to his disciples when he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which shed for you. He was saying, I love you. I paid the price for you. I laid down my life for you. I spill my blood for you. Will you be my bride? Will you marry me? And if we take the cup at the communion table, and if we drink that cup, we are saying, Yes, Jesus, I will be your bride. I accept your marriage proposal. I will marry you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to talk to you just briefly about the bread.
on the communion table. Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And I've taught you over and over again that at the Passover table, which is what Jesus was partaking of with his disciples, at the Passover table, there are three pieces of Jewish matzo bread on the Passover table. And the head, the leader of the table, would take those three pieces of bread and he would put the bread into a pouch with three pockets. And I want you to look, those of you who have never taken of the Lord's table with us, we make our own lots of bread. If you look, this bread is pierced and it is striped and it is unleavened. This bread is a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was pure. He was without leaven. Leaven in scripture represents sin. The word says a little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. So Jesus was pure. He was without sin. This bread, this matzo bread is pierced. The word says they shall look upon me who they have pierced. We know that Jesus' head was pierced with the crown of thorns. His hands were pierced with the nails. His feet were pierced with the nails as they nailed him to the tree, to the cross. We know that the soldier took a spear and pierced our Lord Jesus' side and there came out what? Blood and water. The blood for the washing of the sins and the water just as we wash each other's feet represented being cleansed and washed from sin. Blood and water came on their Savior's side. And this bread is striped. And the scripture says, with his stripes ye are healed. So the bread on the communion table is a picture of the body of our Lord Jesus. And so the head of that table at the Passover meal would put the three pieces of matzo bread in a pouch, one piece in each of these three pouches. And then the head of that table, the leader of the Passover meal would take out the middle piece of bread and he would break this bread and he would take a piece of this bread and he would wrap this piece of bread in a linen pouch and he would hide it. And then after the Passover meal, it was the custom in Jewish households for the children to search for that piece of bread. And that piece of bread that was broken, wrapped in linen, and hidden, the Greek word is alcoman. Alcoman. And it is a Greek word meaning a kind of dessert. And as the children of that Jewish household would search for that alcoman, what it was, everything Jesus did, everything done in the Old Testament is a picture of the Lord Jesus. And as that bread was broken, as it was wrapped in linen, as it was hidden, it represented our Lord Jesus' body being broken. He died on the cross, and when they took his body down from the cross, they wrapped it in linen, and he was buried in a borrowed tomb. He was hidden. Oh, but after three days, he was found. He was resurrected. And normally we go through the whole ceremony of the children finding that piece of outcoming, that piece of broken bread that was buried, that was wrapped in linen, that was hidden. And there's just too much to tell. I can't tell it all in one teaching. So I'm trying to cut it as short as possible. So after the children found the afkumen, found the piece of unleavened bread that was broken, that was wrapped in linen, that was buried or hidden, the child would bring it back to the head of the Jewish table, the host, and he would take out that piece of resurrected bread that had been found and it was this piece of bread, the afkomer, that had been broken, that had been wrapped in linen, that had been hidden or buried, and that had been found or resurrected. It was this piece that everyone took off at that communion table at the Passover feast. It was the afkomer that Jesus said is my body, which was broken. 
for you. This do in remembrance of me. So as we partake of this bread, we are partaking of the body of Lord Jesus. His body was broken. His body was wrapped in linen. His body was buried in a tomb. Oh, but at that third day, he was resurrected. He came out of that tomb and he had a new body. And just as we come to the communion table, Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. When we come to the communion table, when we take of the alcohol, when we partake of that cup of wine representing his blood that was shed for us, we do this in remembrance of him, remembering what he did for us, remembering what his death, his burial, his resurrection did for us. And then, at the end of the Passover meal, they would sing a hymn or a song. It was called, in Hebrew, the Halal, H-A-L-L-E-L. And what they would do is actually sing psalms. They would sing Psalms 113 through Psalms 118. They would sing that whole section of the book of Psalms. And did you know that Jesus did this at the end of the Passover meal that he celebrated with his disciples? In the book of Mark, chapter 14, verses 22 through 26, it tells the story of how after supper they partook of the bread they partook of the cup, and when they had sung a hymn or a song, the Halal, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And I don't have a natural ability or talent to sing, so I always just hum or sing a song pertaining to the blood of Jesus. Like, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that blood. Hallelujah. The blood that washes and cleanses us from our sin. I tell you, that is about a five-hour teaching I've given you tonight. Really condemned. <laughs> I know I've left out a lot, but there's just too much to tell. You can't get it in. There is too much. And I want us to come, and I want us to partake of the Lord's table, His broken body. His blood that was shed for us. And remember, you are worthy to approach this table. You are worthy to partake of communion. The blood of Jesus Christ has made you worthy. He shed his blood for you to receive forgiveness of sins. And if you have accepted him as your Lord and as your Savior, you are worthy to come to this table. Amen? And just as that water, as we wash one another's feet, represented us being washed and cleansed. Jesus said, we are all clean. Just as that water represented us being cleansed. The blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And you are worthy. Right. And I'm going to cut the lights and we're going to light the candles and we're going to partake of the Lord's table. What an honor, what a privilege that we have to come and to partake of the Lord's table and to partake of his body and of his blood. Oh, what a privilege. What a privilege. Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given or broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. What an honor, what a privilege that we have to approach the table of the Lord and to partake of his body and to partake of his blood. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to serve you, and when you break off a piece of the ash corn, just hold it, and we will partake of this bread 
representing the body of our Lord. We'll all partake of it together. Oh God, what a privilege. What an awesome, awesome privilege that we have to partake of your broken body. Wonderful Jesus. Oh God, I thank you. I thank you. What a privilege. What an honor that you have given us to be able to take your body. Oh God, thank you for the honor of coming to your table. Oh God, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. We thank you. Wonderful Jesus. This bread represents his body that was broken. For oh God, just as Jesus took this bread and as he broke this bread when he had given thanks at that Passover table that night when he instituted what we celebrate as communion. He said, as oft as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And oh God, we take this bread in remembrance of what our Lord and what our Savior has done for us. We remember Jesus, how that you was tortured and whipped and beaten with that cat of nine tails. We remember how stripes was placed upon your back. Oh, Jesus, we remember how you were beaten, how you were tortured by the Roman soldiers. And we remember that the scripture says, with your stripes, we are healed. And we remember as they nailed your body to the cross and as the nails pierced, your hands and your feet and as that crown of thorns pierced your head as the blood flowed from your body the blood provided forgiveness and cleansing for our sins and we remember how that you said that as your body was broken that it represented healing for us it meant that we could receive healing in our body because the word of God says with his stripes we are healed and just as that first Passover meal was instituted back in the book of Exodus chapter 12 as they ate that first Passover lamb as they placed the lamb in their mouth healing came into their bodies because the word says that you brought them out and there was not one feeble one among their tribes as they ate the lamb, as they placed the lamb in their mouth. Healing came into their bodies. And this night, as we place this bread in our mouths, healing comes into our bodies because we are eating the lamb. Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And as we place this bread in our mouth, we are placing the lamb in our mouths and healing comes into our body as we eat the lamb and we receive your broken body as we eat this bread and we remember Jesus that with your stripes we are healed and as we eat this bread healing comes into our bodies and we eat it in remembrance of you and we do it and we receive healing in our bodies now as we eat the bread thank you thank you jesus amen amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus, for the lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the lamb. Oh, we eat the lamb. We take this bread. We eat this bread. We eat the lamb. And just as the children of Israel ate that Passover lamb, when they ate that one, healing came into their body. When two and a half million Jews were healed that night at that Passover table. And this is our Passover table. 
as we come to the table of the Lord, and as we have eaten the lamb, we have placed that bread in ourselves, and the lamb has entered into our bodies, and the lamb that was pierced, the lamb that was striped, the lamb that was broken has entered into our bodies, and with his stripes we are healed. And when we go forth from this place, we go forth with the Lamb inside of us. The Lamb of God is now inside of us, bringing healing, bringing health, making us whole from this day forward because we go forth with the Lamb inside of us. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for providing your son to be the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for the lamb. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And then Jesus took the cup, the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. And as we take this cup, and notice I have two cups. The larger cup has wine. They partook of wine at the Passover table. The smaller cup has grape juice. You may partake of whichever cup you choose. And remember, as you take the cup, and as you drink the cup, you are accepting the marriage proposal of the Lamb. Jesus, the Lamb of God, said this cup is the new covenant or the new testament in my blood which is shed for you. He is saying, I love you. I paid the price for you. I laid down my life for you. Will you marry me? Will you be my bride? And as we take the cup, and as we drink the cup, we are saying, yes, Jesus, I will be your bride. I will marry you. Thank you for your cup, the cup of remembrance. And we take the cup, Jesus, and we drink the cup, and we remember you, Jesus. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your cup. Thank you for your cup that represented your blood. The blood that was shed for us. For the word of God says without the shedding of blood there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. But we have received shed blood of the Lamb. We have taken the cup and we have drunk that cup. The cup of the new covenant in Jesus' blood. That blood that was shed for us. That provided the cleansing. That provided the washing from our sins. Thank you for the cup. Thank you, Jesus, for the cup. Thank you, Jesus, for your cup. The cup that represents your blood. Your blood that was shed for us that we would receive cleansing from our sins. And just as soldier pierced your side, and blood and water ran out, the blood provided forgiveness of sins, and the water provided the washing of the sins away. Just as when we go down into the water of baptism, when we go into that watery grave, represents our sins being buried in that watery grave and we are raised to a newness of life and just as we have washed one another's feet this night and we have received cleansing it represents our sins being washed away and being cleansed by the blood of the lamb thank you for the washing of the water of your word thank you for the washing away of our sins with the blood of the Lamb, the blood, the cup of the covenant, which Jesus said is in 
my blood. Thank you for the cup. Thank you for the wonderful privilege, oh God, of coming to your communion table one more time and partaking of the body and of the blood of our Lord and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we say, yes, we will be your bride. We have drunk the cup and we will wait for you. And I thank you that you will come. You will come for us and take us to be your bride to be with you forever and forever and forever. And we will sit down at the table with you at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and you, Jesus, our bridegroom, will serve us at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we have come to this table tonight in remembrance of you. And now we are waiting, Lord Jesus, to drink this cup with you new in the kingdom and become your bride, the bride of Christ. And everybody said, Amen! Amen, amen. amen. And now we're going to sing a hymn, sing a song, sing the halal, sing about the blood of the Lamb. That's the last thing they did at the Passover meal. And we are going to sing about the blood of the Lamb. Lead us as we sing. <laughs>